All right. We'll so okay. welcome um, everyone to our Wednesday morning grand rounds for UCSF orthopedic surgery. Uh, today we have one of our faculty members, Dr. Thomas Peterson, uh, presenting to us. And for an introduction, I'll turn it over to Dr. Lotes. Thank you, Drew. So it's my pleasure to introduce Tom Peterson this morning, who is a bioinformaticist and one of our most recent faculty hires. Uh, Tom trained at the University of Maryland, where he earned degrees in information systems and biomedical informatics. He came to UCSF as a postdoc in 2016, joining the lab of Atul Butte at the Baker Computational Health Sciences Institute, where he developed broad skills in working with electronic health record data. Uh, Tom joined our department in 2020, and for the last two years has been serving as the director of our analytics core within the core center for mechanistic patient-centric phenotyping and chronic low back pain, or also called REACH. That's part of the NIH backpack program funded under the HEAL initiative. In that role, Tom's been instrumental in establishing pipelines for merging electronic health record data and with other sensor information and patient reported outcomes, and then deploying novel AM, AI, and ML tools for precision medicine purposes. With support of the department, Tom's uh, also been working as part of our clinical research initiative to bring um, these technologies uh, across our department to other services and faculty. And a real strength is his joint appointment in the Computational Institute, which is, uh, I think, arguably one of the, the top in the country, if not the world, in terms of data uh, science. So we've got a great conduit to bring uh, this novel technology to our, our faculty. And I think in a lot of ways, uh, information sciences like bioengineering was 30 years ago, where there's uh, a lot of new language uh, that needs to be uh, communicated to our faculty as they understand what the opportunities are, what the technologies are, and what the tools are. And what I'm excited about is that data science is really a much more accessible research platform for our faculty who are broadly distributed around the Bay Area, uh, as opposed to uh, you know doing cadaver studies on an MTS machine or what's called the bone crusher. And so I think Tom with his team of data crunchers are going to be a great asset for our department. And I have no doubt in the near future, we'll be top in the country uh, in the area of data science applied to musculoskeletal care. So uh, you can take it away, Tom. Thank you for your time this morning. It's great. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thanks for Drew for setting this up and everyone for having me. Um, uh, so I'm gonna be talking today about a uh, phenotyping patients uh, using retrospective uh, data science. Uh, and specifically how we can apply this to uh, research that I'm interested in and everyone else here is interested in as well. Uh, so a little bit about me. Uh, so Jeff did a really good job of setting this up. Uh, so by trade, I am a biomedical informatician. Uh, so I have affiliations with Department of Orthopedic Surgery here at UCSF. Uh, also the, uh, the Baker Computational Health Sciences Institute, uh, which is the BCHSI. Uh, I'm also affiliated with the University of California Health and the San Francisco VA Medical Center. Um, and we're going to talk about some of uh, the projects I've been doing for them as well uh, in this retrospective phenotyping talk. Um, and uh, I'm also the director of the analytics core uh, for the large grant uh, that uh, Jeff is spearheading, uh, uh, which is the uh, UCSF REACH uh, uh, multi-core center. Um, so uh, I, I really am uh, multifaceted and uh, I, I'm super glad to be here in the orthopedic surgery department, not just uh, for uh, uh, my work with uh, Jeff and with all my other collaborators, um, but uh, also um, uh, so that I can help set up new kinds of research using new kinds of databases, um, uh, specifically in this particular field. Uh, so this is gonna be my outline and I'm gonna be coming back to this frequently because I'm gonna be talking about several different uh, projects here. So feel free at any time to uh, stop me, interrupt me, uh, ask any questions, uh, because we may move on to a separate topic uh, if you don't get them out quick enough. Uh, and again, apologies for uh, the delay. Uh, hopefully we can get through all of this, and, but I think that we will. Uh, so the first thing I'm gonna do is gonna give you some background about UCSF REACH and the analytics for it. Uh, and then I'm gonna talk about electronic health records and the resources we have available at UCSF uh, and University of California wide. Uh, and then we're gonna talk specifically about studies uh, based on electronic health record phenotyping. Uh, so large scale comparison of treatment pathways, uh, mainly phenotyping, UCSF integrated spine service, uh, automated phenotyping for, uh, for these types of data sets, uh, 
Uh, and also phenotyping in the case of missing data. And we're going to talk about uh, a machine learning project I have with uh, adult spinal fusion and also the uh, SFBA intensive pain, uh, pain rehabilitation program. Okay, uh, so first I'm gonna get started with uh, some background about UCSF for each the analytics for. NIH HEAL uh, is helping end addiction long-term. Uh, this is an initiative uh, specifically focused on preventing opioid misuse, uh, developing new treatment, uh, addiction treatments, uh, making effective treatments accessible to people, uh, and providing solutions to uh, the 50 million people suffering from chronic pain. Uh, as a subsidiary of this initiative, there's the BACPAC, which stands for the Back Pain Consortium. Uh, uh, back pain is one of the most common forms of chronic pain. It's the most common non-cancer reason for opioid prescriptions. Uh, the mechanisms are very complex and the underlying cause is unknown. Interestingly, uh, in Western countries, uh, societal costs for back pain are estimated to be one to 2% of the, of the GDP. And uh, the majority of these costs are caused by uh, productivity loss and disability, right? So this is a very important topic. So just like Backpack as a subsidiary of the NIH EEL initiative, uh, here at REACH, uh, we are a Backpack Mechanistic Research Center, which is a U19 type funding. Uh, the idea here is that there are several uh, mechanistic research centers, uh, one here at UCSF uh, headed by Dr. Lutz, uh, one at University of Pittsburgh and one at University of Michigan. And our task is to deeply phenotype adults with chronic low back pain. Uh, and we're looking for response to treatment, heterogeneity effects, and making algorithms to tailor to specific patient-specific treatments. Um, here at UCSF REACH, uh, it's, it's kind of a mouthful, uh, but the acronym is a uh, core center for patient-centric mechanistic phenotyping and chronic low back pain. So this is a $30 million multi-core mechanistic research center uh, uh, the goals are to uh, uh, collect prospective data and uh, understand as best as we can for retrospective data, biopsychosocial mechanisms of back pain, also uh, biomechanics, psychology, and social environmental factors. Uh, also, uh, a major goal is to determine the optimal, uh, being the most efficacious or cost-effective uh, clinical metrics that we can capture for understanding patient-specific uh, outcomes. There are a lot of possible data sources that you can use in general uh, for studying uh, uh, retrospective and prospective research. Uh, as far as clinical data goes, uh, you could be like us and you can make new existing trials uh, to make new clinical trials. You can aggregate existing clinical trials. You can get an IRB to look at your current patients and study them. Uh, and you can also uh, perform experimental results, so say in uh, uh, animal models. There's also other data sets that you can use uh, that already exist, uh, such as electronic health records. Uh, I'm gonna show you today one of the cool databases that we have available, which is the UC Health Data Warehouse, uh, which has uh, data sets from uh, six major uh, academic medical institutions all combined into one. Uh, there's also data from the, the, the VA um, and a group called the Odyssey Network, which is a very large connected electronic health record. And these contain lots of different types of data, right? So you have structured data, meaning rows and columns, uh, what diagnosis does this person have, what, is the, what are their demographics, et cetera. There's also clinical images uh, and clinical notes, which are a little bit harder to get at, especially if you don't have people manually reviewing the records. Someone like me, who's a data nerd, uh, has a little bit tougher time getting at clinical images and clinical notes. Uh, but we're gonna talk about some of the ways we can overcome that today. There's also much larger databases like administrative claims databases uh, from Medicare, Optum Labs, uh, Truven, MarketStan, uh, even the University of California has administrative claims databases. Um, and those can be useful. There's also nationwide surveys uh, such as the uh, ACS, uh, American Community Survey, uh, the N. Haynes, which is a large uh, population wide uh, uh, representative of the population survey, and also the one on the right, which is in uh, Korean, this is the KN Haynes, which is the Korean version. So what do we do with all these? And what are they, use, and what are they useful for? Uh, well, here at REACH, what we're doing is prospective data collection, right? So we have many cores here. Uh, and like I said, I'm part of the, uh, uh, the director of the analytics core. Uh, Jeff is uh, the head of the admin core. Uh, and there's also a clinical core who is helping us set up and interpret the data, uh, set up the clinical trials and interpret the data. Uh, so UCSF REACH has multi-cores uh, 
uh, like this, right? Uh, so uh, the biobehavioral four is focusing on a biobehavioral phenotype, right? So the, the patients that we get in, uh, we give them uh, self-report profiling. So pain surveys, uh, uh, pain catastrophizing scale, promise scores, those types of things. Uh, we put them through neural profiling uh, through fMRI. Um, we also do quantitative sensory testing profiling, uh, where we look at their response to different types of stimuli, including pain and heat. Um, we're also looking at uh, creating through our pathophysiology for a uh, pathophysiology phenotype. Uh, so this includes quantitative markers, meaning different types of imaging. There's lots of different types of imaging, including ideal imaging, end plate markers, um, the works really. Uh, we also have serum markers, so we're taking blood samples uh, and also looking at muscle quality. Uh, and finally, we have a biomechanical phenotype. Uh, and this is looking at uh, performance or motion monitoring uh, with cameras or wearable sensors. Uh, so these would be uh, uh, different types of activity group data uh, or uh, different types of 3D depth camera monitoring, right? Uh, so we're really uh, creating a, uh, many different types of ways to analyze these patients, right? And as you can imagine, this costs a lot of money. So, so what you wanna do is you wanna figure out what is going to be the most important for phenotyping chronic low back pain patients. So in the future, we'll have that information and we'll be able to tell uh, what this particular type of low back pain patient uh, is suffering from. So UCSF range is collecting three different data sets. Uh, so on the left, uh, we're calling this one deep phenotyping, right? So this is the come back data set is our name for it. This is a longitudinal prospective cohort uh, with patients with uh, chronic low back pain. Uh, the goal is to recruit 400 patients from four clinical sites with follow-up data every six months and annual clinical visits. Uh, so this is a, I'll, I'll once again air quotes, deep phenotyping. Uh, so like we just said, uh, we have lots of different data on these patients, uh, PRO data, surveys, uh, biobehavioral information, pathophysiology, biomechanical, and uh, biospecimen. And these patients receive the standard of care, right? So we look at them throughout their uh, uh, normal course of treatment, uh, and we look at who's going to get worse or better. And we can also isolate specific types of treatments to see how these patients are doing with that type of treatment. There's also a second data set that we're collecting, which is the back home data set. And this one we're going to call shallow phenotyping, again, with air quotes. Uh, so this is a digital perspective cohort. Uh, sort of an E cohort, right? So this is uh, all uh, almost exclusively uh, online uh, phenotyping that we're doing. Uh, so this is a lot larger data set, uh, uh, N uh, size, uh, 5,000 uh, patients uh, all across University of California. So we e consent them and they follow up every six months. Uh, they get different types of questionnaires. Uh, and we also have all the electronic health record data that we can study from. Uh, just like the come back data set, uh, these patients have received the standard of care and we also have specific uh, types of um, uh, uh, ancillary studies that we're performing uh, to look at, uh, say, goal setting using Fitbit, or also an app that we've created to uh, uh, understand their mindfulness and help them with that, right? So these are specific interventions that we're doing with subsets of the back home cohort. And finally, uh, we have EHR phenotyping. So you notice that we're getting uh, less and less data, right? So deep phenotyping, lots of data. Uh, shallow phenotyping, you, know, you get types of questionnaires uh, that you can actually solicit uh, and you can put them through uh, specific ancillary studies. Uh, but EHR phenotyping, you get a lot less data, right? Uh, the good news is that you can, uh, you might have a lot of data, right? So you can have all the data from University of California. You can have external EHR systems uh, through uh, data use agreements and collaboration opportunities. Uh, you can really get a large data set if you try hard here. Um, uh, so the idea is that you'll have structured data like uh, diagnosis and procedures. You'll have clinical notes and images. Uh, but, but the trick is to figure out how to use this information. So uh, in order of phenotyping depth uh, of the different types of data sets that we have, uh, the comeback data set is the uh, deepest phenotyping that we have. Uh, uh, in the middle is EHR data. So this is routinely collected EHR data uh, and things like administrative claims data sets and nationwide surveys have very low amounts of information. However, uh, the least amount of information that you collect on, on patients, uh, the cheaper it is uh, as for cost of research. 
the benefit of uh, these um, uh, data sets that have shallow phenotyping is that your cohort size tends to be a lot larger. Whereas in the comeback data set, we have an, an expected end of 400, right? And finally, uh, the outcome metrics are really important, right? Because uh, in survey data, you actually don't have any outcome metrics. You don't know how their pain's changing over time. You don't know if their pain goes away, uh, if they develop new conditions, if they need specific treatments. Uh, administrative claims data, you might actually have some of the information about treatments, uh, whereas electronic health records, uh, you'll have a lot more data. Uh, finally, uh, if you get up to some of the databases we're collecting prospectively, you have incredibly detailed outcome metrics, right? And the goal is to understand what types of data uh, are the most effective for uh, identifying clinically relevant chronic low back pain phenotypes, right? So if you don't have to spend all the money on the very expensive comeback data sets, uh, you know, you, you put them through all kinds of MRI machines, you uh, strap sensors to them, and, you know, you get a data nerd like me to try and interpret it, uh, that, that costs a lot of money. Uh, if you can do some of what you want with less data, meaning less uh, phenotype you have to collect for the patients, it might be desirable. So I'm going to be coming back to this slide, uh, but this is just an idea of the general analysis tracks uh, for uh, studying uh, prospective or retrospective research. Okay. So uh, number one is one that everyone's very familiar with. So this is traditional, traditional statistical analysis. Uh, you, uh, you try and associate factors uh, with outcome variables that you care about. And then in the end, you'll have a list of factors that are important for a particular outcome. Uh, you can look at treatment pattern frequency, right? So uh, who's getting what treatment and when, and why does it matter? Um, the second track is unsupervised machine learning. So here we can do uh, fancy methods like principal component analysis uh, or clustering methods to identify specific phenotypes within your data sets. Uh, we actually have a, a, uh, an example of this a little bit later on I'm gonna show you. And finally, we can uh, perform uh, a third type of track which is supervised machine learning. Uh, so these would be uh, regressions, decision trees, neural networks. Uh, there's also a lot of existing tools uh, out there. Uh, and the big difference in the third track is that you don't use the entire data set. Typically what you do is you uh, leave some of the data set out, either 30% uh, or 20% uh, for testing your models, right? Uh, or alternatively, you can have an external data set that's not a part of your uh, database at all that you use for testing. Uh, so these three types of tracks, I'm gonna mention them as we go forward uh, when, when I describe some of these different projects. Um, before the uh, this looks, patients from the comeback, we have uh, manually annotated EHR records. We have uh, deeply phenotyped uh, PRO survey data, quantitative markers, measurements, physical function. Uh, really, every all the works, everything we can throw at it. Uh, we perform multiple analyses on these. So you'll use 100% of the patients, and you'll uh, do uh, analysis tracks one and two. So traditional. Uh, statistical analyses and also uh, phenotype identification. And then separately, you split the data for predictive model. Likewise, for the back home data set, uh, you have a little bit less information that's available. So you don't have quantitative markers or measurements of physical function. Uh, but you do the same thing, right? So you uh, uh, perform tracks one and two, and these are two separate analyses you can do on the data. Uh, finally, we have EHR records, which is very sparse, uh, <laughs> which we dubbed EHR phenotyping. Uh, so again, you only have the HR records and the, uh, the patient reported outcome and different survey metrics are very sparse. Um, and once again, you can use the HR data for uh, tracks one and two analysis. Um, but for track three, uh, for predictive modeling, uh, what you can do is you can build models using different types of data modalities, right? So uh, in the red line, uh, we have a data modality that's built with all of the possible data meaning this will come from something like come back a deeply phenotyped data set. Uh, and on the orange line, you have uh, a shallow phenotyped model. Possibly this is one that only comes from electronic health records. And you can directly compare uh, to the um, uh, testing sets that you've left out, right? So you've left out 30% training in the comeback data set, 30% training in the electronic health record data set, 30% training in the uh, back home data set you can use for testing and you can compare directly to models that are built with more uh, comprehensive and expensive data. Okay, uh, so just to, just to give you an idea about the, the types of data we're talking about here, 
I want to break it up between retrospective and prospective data. So mostly what I've been talking about so far uh, is prospective data that's been uh, collected by that's being collected by reach. Um, so all the baseline data for all these patients uh, are expected to be complete in 2022. Uh, and the follow-up data will be complete in 2024. Uh, but unfortunately, there's going to be very little time uh, available for analysis uh, because that is when the, the funding runs out. Right? Um, for external data set collection, we've actually just completed this. So this is a collection of 13 external data sets. Uh, these are clinical trials and registries, uh, those types of things. Um, and this is comprised of about 30,000 patients with chronic low back pain. So this is a, a retrospective data set uh, that's external to reach that we've collected and we're going to start doing uh, analysis on. Um, so from here, I'm going to start talking about um, retrospective data that we're using for electronic health records, uh, using from electronic health records uh, to create analyses that uh, I think it'll interest everyone on this call. Um, so if you have been using electronic health record data, uh, we're talking about uh, internal UCSF data uh, for chronic low back pain patients, which we've already done. Actually, you'll see some of our results today. Uh, we also have initiatives at the Baker Computational Health Sciences Institute and UC Health, where we're um, uh, collecting external data from other UC sites and we're harmonizing them. This has been complete. I'm actually gonna show you some results from uh, those data sets today. Uh, and also we have initiatives at the UCSF Department of Orthopedic Surgery. Uh, so we have ongoing collaborations with uh, many people in the department uh, for doing a lot of things we're talking about today. So phenotype and electronic health records, uh, studying uh, UCSF data, UC-wide data. Um, and also excitingly, we have uh, data that's coming from PRO, uh, patient reported outcome capture systems. Uh, we've implemented one here called the code capture system. Uh, and it's uh, filling up with data as we speak. And I'm expecting to join these types of uh, important uh, uh, detailed information to electronic health records uh, in the future for analysis. Okay, um, so that brings me back to my outline. Uh, so that was a uh, background to the reach and the analytics core. Uh, so now I'm gonna give you some background on electronic health records and available resources we have at UCSF and UC wide. Uh, so University of California, uh, this is actually a little bit of an old slide but we have uh, over a million patients that we have data on in our retrospective data sets. Uh, so this consists of clinical images, structured electronic health record data, clinical notes, different concepts, uh, patient reported outcomes. Uh, these were originally built uh, for financial billing and insurance claims, uh, but uh, people like me and people over at the, BC, uh, the BCHSI are really trying to use these, uh, these data sets for, for research as opposed to just billing. Uh, but there's somewhat of a lack of an institutional interest uh, and technical skills are, are enormous uh, in order to actually analyze these data. So large scale electronic health record data is gonna be available for a variety of conditions. And by that, I mean, the things that you want to study, right? But this is not an easy task, especially for uh, non-surgical patients like chronic low back pain. Uh, phenotyping and modeling these patients is very hard. Uh, one problem is that there is a lack of connectivity between electronic health records, uh, leading to data silos and uh, making it totally unusable in research for the most part, unless you have access to the data and your company or your institution uh, owns the data. Uh, the structured data, uh, meaning the, the rows or columns, uh, they're often missing information, uh, which can be a, a challenging technical hurdle to overcome. Um, the clinical notes we also have available, but they're stored in free text format, so you can't uh, really extract the information unless you have an expert that goes through the notes, or if you have some sort of uh, intelligent automated system that can read the note for you and pull out what you need. And we've actually done a little bit of that. I'm gonna talk about that later. And also cl clinical images are not segmented and the information that you really want from them is also only recorded in free text format. All right, so this is, this is a difficult task. One of the things I've done, this is actually some of my work in my postdoc, uh, we've created a system for um, uh, safely de-identifying uh, not just the structured data, but also the free text clinical notes. Uh, it has a very cute name. It's uh, filter, which is protected health information, PHI filter. Um, and essentially this is a scheme for uh, automatically de-identifying clinical notes. Uh, we actually manually de-identified 25,000 notes to train this model. Um, 
And uh, we, we applied this model to all the nodes at UCSF. Uh, we've actually also applied this to all the nodes at University of California Y. Uh, and uh, we have uh, an external company, uh, in this case, Cal Forensics, who actually certifies that this uh, data is de-identified. And by that, I mean, uh, they take on the risk in case somebody uh, re-identifies. Um, but you know, this is actually a very good tool. Uh, I don't think that it's easy uh, or even possible to re-identify many of these patients. Uh, but the idea is that uh, since we can de-identify the data sets, it's going to uh, uh, incentivize institutions like UCSF or other University of California sites uh, to now share the data, right? Because there's less risk in sharing the data and um, you can build more and more interconnected data sets uh, that have been de-identified together. So the incentive is here now and the ability to share is here. Uh, this is the University of California Health uh, Data Warehouse. Uh, just briefly, there's 5.3 million patients from uh, over a thousand UC affiliated clinical settings. Uh, and you can just see sort of the breakdown over here of where these people live. So we have their exact locations, uh, which means that we can eventually use uh, things that are related to their zip code, like area deprivation index, uh, access to transportation, food, these types of things. This potential to connect to much larger data sets, right? So this is the Odyssey network. And these are uh, different uh, electronic health record databases that are in the same format, right? So this is the OMOP format, which is the format that uh, we at the Baker Institute have been working to put all of the um, data sets from University of California into so we can share them. Uh, so there's 18 different countries, uh, 370 million patients, a lot of data sets here that we want to eventually connect to and have very, very, very large studies, right? So uh, part of what I'm showing you here today uh, is sort of, um, uh, uh, a first or maybe even second step towards getting large, large databases from all over the world to study uh, specific topics, and in this case, uh, chronic low back pain and orthopedic surgery. Okay, uh, so now uh, I'm going to get into some of the studies. Uh, so the first study uh, is going to be using this uh, uh, large uh, UC HCW University of California database uh, for comparison and treatment pathways. Uh, so this is actually not orthopedic surgery, but I think it's really important to show you um, because this is uh, the first ever analysis that's been able to use this University of California Health Data Warehouse database. Um, this is for type 2 diabetes uh, with some of my collaborators from when I was... This just came out this year. Uh, so we were able to identify uh, 1.3 million medication orders for almost 100,000 uh, type 2 diabetic patients. And what you're looking at here is the treatment pathway. So the inner ring uh, is the medication that uh, either uh, we started them on or we increased their medication to, right? So in type two diabetes, uh, typically uh, the flow of how you treat a patient is you start them on metformin. Uh, if their H1B doesn't uh, uh, come to acceptable range, uh, then you either increase their medication to a dual therapy or you put them on insulin. Uh, and again, if the dual therapy doesn't work, then you either put them on insulin or you increase them to a triple therapy, right? So that's what you're seeing here. Uh, so if the orange section for metformin goes to metformin, then they were given a new metformin dose. If the orange section was gone, uh, goes to this uh, bright purple, then they were increased to a dual therapy for metformin and sulfonuria. Right, and so you'll see that uh, we actually have uh, these five major uh, University of California academic medical centers, uh, and we have uh, uh, masked their names. So you can't tell which one's which. Although if you really thought really hard about it, you can probably do it. Um, but this is one of the reasons that we're doing it is because we actually want to look at the differences between these, uh, these institutions and we don't want to make any of them mad. Uh, so one of the important findings that we found here, and we found a lot of things, I'm just going to highlight um, one of the important things to consider when uh, prescribing type 2 uh, diabetic medications um, is that uh, some medications cost more, but they can also prevent stroke, heart attack, and heart failure, right? So uh, metformin costs $24 yearly. It's basically free. Uh, deep B4 inhibitors are a little bit more expensive. They're newer drugs, uh, $4,500 a year. And the most expensive is YLB1 receptor agonist, which is you know almost $9,000 a year. But the idea is that you can actually prevent uh, some of these adverse events, which cost a lot of money, like stroke, 
heart failure and heart attack, which can you know cost tons of money, not just to patients and their health, but also to you know, providers of UCSF and insurance companies that we run. Uh, so the idea is that what we wanted to do is look at how frequently these medications are given in the context of prescribing new medications on top of previous ones. So this is the punchline here. Uh, we found significant differences in utilization of cardioprotective medications. When our doctors at University of California are increasing from dual to triple therapy in diabetic patients with high cardiovascular risk. So what's cool about this analysis is that what we're doing is we're using a machine learning prediction score. This is the Framingham cardiovascular risk score to assess specific patients likelihood to have cardiovascular events, adverse cardiovascular events. And taking those patients with high Framingham risk score, we look at when our doctors prescribe them a new therapy on top of their dual therapy to make a triple therapy, do they use these cardiovascular protective medications? And what we're finding is that there's a difference between the sites, right? So uh, UCC, UCD, and UCE here, which obviously not their real names, they're very similar and they tend to prescribe more medications than the other sites. Whereas UCA, only two out of almost 2000 patients that uh, were prescribed this uh, type of treatment did not get the cardiovascular protective medication. Right? So uh, the, the takeaway from this is that you can use tools for predicting the future. In this case, uh, cardiovascular risk scores, and we can couple this with interconnected electronic records. And this can help us reduce potential risk for patients while minimizing overall costs if we use specific types of medication or treatment schemes. Okay. Um, so I know that, that might've been a lot, but I'm, uh, that was all I need to talk about diabetes. None of this is gonna be about diabetes anymore. Um, the, the next topic we're gonna talk about is manually phenotyping the UCSF electronic health record database uh, to get the integrated spine service patients. So I'm gonna bring this back to uh, our different analysis tracks for producing uh, research. Uh, so uh, here we're gonna be talking about uh, one analysis that is a traditional statistical analysis and one analysis that's an unsupervised machine learning analysis. So to phenotype the UCSF integrated spine service, uh, we searched for patients who were 18 years of age, uh, had a UCSF uh, ISS baseline, uh, that gave us 631 patients. We required they have at least one promise score, uh, which is 444 patients. Uh, and we ended up with uh, 390 patients that met the inclusion exclusion criteria and we manually reviewed them, right? So this isn't an automated system. Uh, we pull all of their information from electronic health records and we manually review those as well. Uh, we get their VAS scores, uh, baseline and follow-up, which is the pain score. We get their promise scores, baseline and follow-up. We manually annotate their MRIs and free text clinical notes, right? So this is the most detailed data set you can get from electronic health record because we have actual experts going over it and fixing it for us. This is the result of the initial analysis. Uh, so this is actually coming out of the, the REACH clinical core. Uh, and when I say that, I mean, uh, you know, this is a multi-core center and we're obviously all involved in these projects, but uh, Patricia Zhang and Kader O'Neill have really been spearheading this. Uh, so this is a um, results for a traditional statistical analysis. This would be like a track one. Uh, and we're looking at the start back tool uh, and how it predicts patient specific change in promise scores. Uh, so what you're looking at here is anything that is highlighted in yellow uh, has a significance level of uh, uh, under 0 0.1. Anything that's highlighted in green is under 0 0.05, right? Uh, so there's a lot of things that are associated here with uh, change in promise score, which is uh, mental promise score, which is the first column, and change in physical promise score, which is the second column. Uh, and interestingly, I want to draw your attention over on the right uh, to the start back risk assessment. So patients with medium or high risk were more likely uh, to have worse changes in their promise uh, physical score. And patients with high risk were more likely to have uh, uh, increase in their promise mental score, meaning you know, it's, it's bad. Um, and this is also, uh, uh, there are also some other uh, factors that we're identifying as significant here. Uh, but you see that the title of this manuscript is Predictive Utility of the Start Back Tool in a Chronic Low Back Pain Patient uh, Population uh, and so really where what we've done is we've validated the start back tool for predicting change in promise scores for these uh, uh, chronic low back pain patients. Um, so this is uh, in and of itself its own study and this is gonna be submitted next year. Separately, in what will be more of a track two analysis, we're performing phenotype discovery uh, using principal component analysis and nonlinear PCA. Uh, 
So when we performed a principal component analysis, which is essentially just uh, reducing the dimensionality, uh, trying to find um, uh, uh, individual uh, vectors that can explain the data set. Uh, on the left, when we tried the original uh, PCA, the standard PCA has a high complexity structure. Many PCs are involved in these variables. Um, and uh, so what we did is uh, we decided to apply nonlinear PCA uh, to make it a little bit more interpretable. And this is what it looks like after doing nonlinear PCA and also uh, performing very max rotation. Uh, so this is a post hoc procedure uh, meant to maximize explainability. And just briefly, what it does is it, uh, it reduces the number of variables that go into a single dimension. So you can see down here in the bottom right, uh, we had three different variables that were pretty much the same. Uh, so uh, overweight, obesity, BMI, and weight. Uh, and it was able to group these into one PC. Uh, similarly, we have um, uh, other ones as well uh, that make sense to be grouped together, uh, right? Uh, and so the idea is that uh, now we've represented uh, the patients in uh, a way that makes sense, uh, that has been, uh, the dimensionality has been reduced, and then we can perform cluster, right? Uh, so on the left here, uh, what we've done is we've, uh, we've tested several different types of models for cluster, right? So these are uh, models that have been built off of the uh, PCA results, um, and we look for uh, the Bayesian information criteria uh, over the number of clusters and also the model stability over the number of clusters. Uh, and we decided on uh, uh, diagonal varying in volume, varying in shape uh, and oriented to the axis. The importance of this, uh, uh, the details of this aren't that important. Uh, but we can see over here on the right is that these are the three clusters and how they look over the, uh, the principal component analysis uh, dimensionality reduction that we were just looking at. So I'm just gonna point out a couple of these that are really interesting. So pulmonary disease uh, in the first cluster, uh, it's red, which means that these patients don't tend to have pulmonary disease. In the second cluster, they do tend to have pulmonary disease. It's, it's bright blue. And the third cluster, um, it, it's a little bit less. Uh, having a good baseline in the first cluster uh, is more likely, whereas in the third cluster, it's less likely. And also COPC, which is chronic overlapping pain conditions, it doesn't matter for the first cluster. For the first cl second cluster, they do not have this. And for the third cluster, they do, right? So this is uh, just sort of a, a cool way that we can uh, dig into the data, find the important dimensions, and then make clusters that can be explainable and understandable, right? Uh, so this is a, 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 an analysis that has been finished and we're submitting uh, early next year. Okay, uh, I know that uh, I, I'm sort of uh, running low in time. Uh, so I might not get to some of the information about uh, uh, phenotyping in the case of missing data. But I definitely want to get to the automated phenotyping for larger data sets. Uh, so the previous data set that we saw, uh, this is a manually annotated data set, very high quality. Uh, experts have gone over it. Um, whereas if you were to try and phenotype from electronic health record, try and pull as many patients as you can, say from uh, all over the world, uh, you need some sort of smart system for doing this. Uh, so this is a, a sort of a, a standalone presentation of itself about a, a ancillary study that we have uh, called COCO, uh, which is evaluating the impact of patient social risks on chronic low back pain care. Uh, so this is a collaboration with uh, UCSF Siren, uh, which is uh, the Social Interventions and Research Evaluation Network. Uh, and my, uh, uh, my collaborator, uh, Amelia DeMarchis, uh, is a member of SIREN. Uh, we also have uh, 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 Dima Lutayev, um, who is a, a data scientist like me, and also uh, Peter Abrahamowicz, Ben Lacar, and Sam Pack and Erica Brown, who are helping with this algorithm. Um, so um, uh, social informatics research is very important. Uh, and socially disadvantaged populations are underrepresented in back pain research. Uh, identifying these, uh, these social risk factors are very important. Uh, but it's, it's not exactly easy to do, right? So uh, you might not uh, code these patients as having, uh, say, uh, uh, access to housing, uh, access to food, transportation, financial insecurity in the structured data, right? So you'd have to physically code an IC10 code for that. Um, uh, so what we want to do is we want to build a natural language processing system, which is an automated method to pull this data, the social risk data, out of the free text clinical notes. 
So the aims here is that we want to evaluate how uh, uh, these social risk factors are associated with uh, uh, patient outcomes. We want to test and develop automated methods for identifying social risk information, uh, and also expand and augment medical ontologies um, for social risk factors in order to do so. So the idea is that uh, we're going to build a data set, we're going to build an NLP tool, and we're going to uh, perform an analysis of uh, CLB social risk and the performance of the NLP tool. So how this looks is uh, we identified uh, almost 1,300 patients with at least two low back pain diagnosis codes three months apart. Uh, this also includes all the patients from the internal spine service, right? Uh, the data set that we had just discussed that was manually annotated, right? Uh, and this is important and we'll talk about it later. Uh, we selected all of their progress notes, their emergency department provider notes, uh, health and progress notes, patient instructions, and telephone encounters. We manually annotated a training set from the larger PT population uh, of chronic lower back pain patients. Uh, so this was 80 notes from 73 patients. Uh, we trained the model and we tested our results on the uh, manually annotated data from uh, the internal spine sense. Um, right, so uh, what this gives us is this gives us a validated natural language processing model uh, that can extract social risk factors from clinical notes. And also uh, gives us a data set of 1,300 chronic low back pain patients that we can study that have social risk factor. Uh, so the way that we annotate these is kind of interesting. Uh, so this is the manual annotation tool, the MAE tool. Uh, so we actually have patient, uh, 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 people from uh, the SIREN uh, 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 network physically go and annotate text. Uh, so over on the right, this is uh, not a clinical note. This is the Jabberwocky from Lewis Terrell. And they're highlighting uh, person, places, things. Uh, whereas in clinical notes, you might be highlighting, uh, this is an indication of this social risk factor, or this is pain score. Uh, we also took some time to augment uh, the NLP models with uh, a new ontology. So there's an ontology uh, called the SNOW RX ontology, which is a standard universal medical language system. Uh, and in our secondary aim, we actually expanded and augmented this uh, uh, this ontology to include social risk factors. Uh, and this is important because um, what you can do is if you have an ontology of codes that you're trying to pull out, say for uh, housing and security, uh, then you can use existing tools like CTAKES, which is the clinical text analysis and knowledge extraction system, uh, which looks for these, uh, these medical ontology codes within free text clinical notes. And you can also uh, make your own NLP tool like we've done with uh, uh, what's called SPACI, which is a library in Python. Uh, this is just uh, how we augmented the medical ontology uh, using uh, ontological relationships from the uh, PHIN VADS database. Uh, these are our results for our uh, initial NLP model uh, for extracting social risk factors. Uh, so you can see uh, we're trying uh, three different types of methods here. Uh, so SPACI is in green. Uh, this is the one that we made in-house. Uh, and this is using the COCO ontology, uh, the augmented one. And we also have CTAKES, which is uh, trying with the COCO uh, augmented ontology and also the regular SNOWRX ontology. Uh, what we're looking at here is the F1 score, uh, which is really just uh, a weighted average of precision and recall. Uh, as you can see, the, the green method uh, uh, performs about the same for detecting anxiety and depression, uh, but it really outperforms in things like marital status, uh, transportation access, access to housing, access to social isolation uh, and insurance status, uh, although it's not doing very well in financial strain and we didn't find any uh, issues with access to food at all in equivalents. Right, so uh, this is a tool that we built in-house that does a little bit better than existing tools and we have augmented the uh, medical ontology so that we can search for these types of uh, social risk factors. Um, this is what it looks like. Uh, so. Um, these are the different types of social risk factors that we pulled out of the uh, notes. Um, so uh, the first column is structured data. So this was, these were things that already existed within the data set. Um, the second type is annotated data, meaning uh, uh, data that we actually annotated, uh, our, uh, our annotators discovered. Um, uh, if we look at those two together, meaning uh, annotated and structured data, uh, it looks like there's a little bit more, meaning that uh, the structured information wasn't completely overlapping with the annotated data, which is interesting. 
Uh, and then our NLP tool uh, on the second to last column, uh, what we're pulling out there. Uh, and then we have an all source, meaning all source different types of social risk factors that we found. Uh, and so as per the goal, uh, we want to look at uh, these social risk factors in the context of healthcare outcomes. Uh, and the most readily available healthcare outcome to us, uh, because we're looking at electronic health record databases, is the number of visits. Um, uh, so what we're looking at here is if you have one or more social risk from all source, uh, you, uh, you have a significantly increased odds ratio of uh, having more emergency department visits or hospitalizations, right? So that's interesting and that's what we expected to find. Also, uh, you can look at uh, area deprivation index, which is uh, a measure of, um, uh, of uh, uh, financial inequality in your area. Uh, and this is based on the US census. Uh, and if you have uh, 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 more area deprivation index, meaning you're, uh, you have, um, uh, your area is more financially strained, you're more likely to visit the emergency department or hospitalization. Uh, unfortunately, we're not finding any significance in uh, odds of getting new imaging, uh, uh, meaning you know, MRIs, CTs, uh, those types of things. Uh, and we're now finding more um, specialty visits or PT visits either. Uh, and uh, below, uh, you know, some other things that we found, uh, start back score was important, chronic opioid use was important, uh, trust and comorbidity, comorbidity index, race, ethnicity, and insurance type, right? Uh, so uh, this particular uh, study uh, has two tracks, right? So this is uh, studying the, uh, sort of track one, uh, studying these uh, social risk factors in the context of healthcare utilization. And track two is uh, making this NLP model uh, and validating it and showing the results, uh, showing the performance. Right? So these are two separate uh, types of uh, tasks that came out of this project. Uh, the next step is uh, to uh, complete the analysis uh, and refine uh, 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 the social risk factor uh, analysis pre-publication uh, in the future, we want more collaborations and more data and more powerful NLP model. Um, so it, it looks like I actually did not get to um, the other two, which is unfortunate. Uh, I blame Comcast entirely and also myself somewhat. Um, yeah, uh, if anybody has any questions about any of these, uh, I'd like to thank all my collaborators and thanks everyone for, for having me here today. Um, yeah, uh, please uh, uh, ask any questions you would like and uh, keep in mind that in the future, uh, uh, me and uh, my club. All right, um, did, I think did we lose Dr. Peterson? Uh, but uh, thank you, Dr. Peterson. Um, hopefully we're able to get you back on and I'm um, at least, Relieved that he was lost at the very end. Um, I think Tom has to buy another cup of coffee at the coffee shop. Yeah. <laughs> this meet, the meter ran out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Drew, just a quick comment um, for everybody. I think uh, what, what Tom presented today is sort of a, a manifestation of our vision of uh, combining expertise in um, data analysis, modern data analysis with the the databases that we have around the department the advantages are the granularity of the data that we collect and combining it with the electronic health record and then uh, ultimately across the state of california the uc uh, data sets so uh the there's there's tom again the that particularly the disparities work that he's uh, doing in conjunction with uh, some of the uh, experts uh, in um social determinants of health. I find very fascinating trying to figure out how to do that in arthroplasty, where instead of talking in aggregate about social determinants of health, we're really looking at, in, at high degree of granularity about the specific issues that are, are relevant to practice that impact the outcome in, so, in the area of social, uh, you know, called social challenges broadly. Now, Tom, I see you're back and- um, Yes. Just, uh, just, just commenting on it and complimenting the work you're doing and the possibilities that, that it expands across the department. So thank you very much for your time and effort and collaboration.
Yes, thank you. And I hope that these types of methodologies and uh, techniques that we're doing are going to be applicable to many different types of research uh, that we want to do in the future as more of these databases become more and more connected and larger and our algorithms for uh, identifying and phenotyping patients uh, uh, get a lot better. I see um, Dr. Bourbon's hand up. Hey, Tom, terrific overview. And uh... Uh, the work that you've done uh, with our group, both with the Backpack Project, as well as uh, some other predictive models of length of stay and readmission has, has really been terrific. As you know, we're, we're constantly plagued by the challenges of, uh, of missing data. And um, with regard to uh, both the, the UC Rex program, uh, as well as other um, national or even international programs, how optimistic are you that we can do a better job of collecting the specific missing data that is always problematic, uh, meaning health rate quality of life data, as well as some of the more granular data that uh, can only be gotten through um, through text um, um, or through direct uh, examination of the, of the records. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I did mention that one of the things that we've done here at UCSF to uh, help um, uh, uh, mitigate that problem is we've implemented uh, capture systems, uh, specifically the code database is a uh, patient reported outcome capture system. Uh, so uh, uh, we actually will have information like pain scores, uh, odds west free disability, um, uh, ASA class, um, uh, different uh, 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 survey information that's being collected from these patients. So I'm actually very excited about that. Um, as far as whether or not uh, these types of things are available in the larger data sets, uh, particularly uh, in the de-identified um, UC-wide database, um, a lot of it won't be initially. Uh, and that's a hurdle that you have, that we're gonna have to overcome. Uh, I actually had a whole uh, uh, two sections about missing data that I didn't quite get to, unfortunately. Um, but there are ways that we can do this, right? So if we, uh, if we were to say, um, uh, work with other institutions to uh, include their PRO capture systems uh, is something that I believe that we are trying to do uh, UC wide. Um, and there's also the possibility of uh, using uh, these less detailed databases in conjunction with our more detailed databases, right? So now that we have a very detailed uh, chronic low back pain population, uh, UCSF, uh, the internal uh, the, uh, the integrated spine service uh, that's been manually annotated, we know there are patient outcomes, right? Uh, and if we have larger databases, what we can do is we can uh, either perform uh, unsupervised uh, learning methods, meaning you won't need those, uh, those outcome information, uh, or you can perform uh, supervised learning if you have the outcome information, uh, and then apply it to your, uh, your well annotated um, uh, data set at UCSF, right? Uh, and then you'll be able to tell whether or not your algorithm works based on uh, a data set that you know is accurate and has been manually annotated by experts. Uh, so there are schemes. Uh, so th the short answer is you can use, you can use uh, uh, EHR phenotyping in conjunction with, di with deep phenotyping. And also, uh, I believe in the future, these databases will become more comprehensive. Great. Um... Well, Dr. Peterson, we are just a few minutes past time, so I think we'll conclude there. And um, thank you again for presenting. Sorry for the uh, technical issues, but uh, thank you for persevering and finding a connection. Uh, yeah. And then uh, I hope everyone has a happy holiday season, and we will see you next time in uh, the new year. Thanks, everyone.